Hi everyone, I'm Leah, your lead course instructor here at Advanced eClinical Training, if you don't already know me by now. Um, but you should because we've been going over um, anatomy and physiology. And today we are going to go over the gastrointestinal system. So the gastrointestinal system here. So functions of the gastrointestinal system, there are four main ones. So motility is one. So motil motility refers to the movement of food through the GI tract, through the process of ingestion, mastication, which is chewing, and deglutition. Really? everyone, I'm Leah, your lead course instructor here at Advanced eClinical Training. And by now, you know that we have been going over anatomy and physiology. And so today we are going to talk about the gastrointestinal system. So there are four main functions of the gastrointestinal system and they include motility. So motility is referring to the movement of food through the GI tract, through the process of ingestion, chewing, swallowing, and then peristalsis. Digestion, um, the role of digestion, um, I'm sorry, the role of the digestive process is to break down these food compounds into um, particles that are absorbable um, micronutrients and to separate the individual nutrients from the complex food matrix that enters the body. Through absorption, that is the transport of digested end products from the lumen of the GI tract to the blood or lymph where it's absorbed. And for absorption to happen, the digested food must first enter the mucosal cells by active or passive transport processes. And then the fourth function of the gastrointestinal system is of course elimination. So elimination of indigestible residues from the GI tract via the anus in the form of feces. So the organs of the, the digestive system can be separated into two main groups. First, we have the alimentary canal, also known as the gastrointestinal tract. And its main function is to nourish the body. And then we have the accessory digestive organs. And these organs are critical for orchestrating the breakdown of food and the assimilation of its nutrients into the body. So first we'll begin talking about the alimentary canal organs of the gastrointestinal tract. And this first one is the mouth. Um, so food, of course, enters the digestive tract through the mouth. We have the lips. The lips protect the opening of the mouth. We have our cheeks and the cheeks form the lateral or the side walls of the mouth. We have the palate and the hard palate forms the top of the mouth or the anterior roof of the mouth and the soft palate forms its posterior roof or the bottom part of the mouth. We have the uvula and that is a fleshy finger-like projection of the soft palate. Of course we have the tongue and that's uh, the tongue is a, a muscle that occupies the floor of the mouth and has several bony attachments and uh, two of these are to the hyoid bone and the styloid process of the skull, which we talked about in the muscul musculoskeletal system. And then we have the linguinal frenulum, and this um, is a fold of mucous membrane that uh, secures the tongue to the floor of the mouth and limits um, uh, back movements or posterior movements. We also have the palatine tonsils, and at the top end of the oral cavity um, are a pair of masses of lymphatic tissue known as the palatine tonsils. And then we have the linguinal tonsils and the linguinal tonsils cover the base of the tongue um, and just beyond. Moving along with the elementary canal organs of the gastrointestinal system, we have the pharynx. And as you can see here from the mouth, food passes 
posteriorly into the oropharynx and the lar lar laryngea pharynx. So the oral pharynx um, is behind or at the bottom to the oral cavity. And the laryngeal pharynx um, is continuous with the esophagus just below, and both of which um, are common passageways for food, fluids, and air. Moving along, we have the esophagus. So the esophagus runs from the pharynx through the diaphragm to the stomach, as you can see here in this diagram. Um, it is approximately 25 centimeters or 10 inches long. Uh, and the structure, so the walls of um, the esophagus to the large intestines are made up of the same four basic tissues of tunics that include the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, the serosa, and the intrinsic nerve plexuses, which you can see here in this diagram. Moving along to the stomach. So the stomach's function is it acts as a temporary storage tank for your food as well as a site for food breakdown. So the stomach has five distinctive uh, sections that include the cardia. As you can see here in this diagram, the cardia is right here. And this is the top part of your stomach and it contains the cardiac sphincter, which prevents food from traveling back up to your esophagus. The fundus of the stomach is a rounded section next to the cardia, as you can see right here and it's below your diaphragm. The next part of the stomach is the corpus or the body, and this is the largest, largest section of your stomach. In the body, um, your body will begin to contract and begins to mix the food here. So the um, antrum lies below the body of the stomach, and it holds food until your stomach is ready to send it into your small intestines. And then next we have the pylorus, which is right here. And this is the bottom part of your stomach. And this includes the pyloric sphincter. So this ring of tissue controls when and how your stomach um, contents move to your small intestines. Of course, now we're gonna talk about the small intestines. Um, so this is the body's major digestive organ, the small intestine. So it extends all the way from the pyloric sphincter, remember, which is at the end of the stomach, to the large intestine. And it is the longest section of all of these um, elementary tubes with an average length of eight to 20 feet long. Subdivisions of the small intestines include the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Um, we also have the ileocecal valve, and this is where the ileum meets the large intestine, um, and it joins the both of them together, the small and the large intestine at this valve. So we have microvilli, and these are tiny projections of the plasma membrane of the mucosa cells that give the cell surface like a very fuzzy appearance. So um, they help to complete the digestion of proteins and carbohydrates in the small intestines. The villi are finger-like projections of the mucosa that help um, to give it a velvety appearance and feel um, much like, like the soft nap of a, a towel. And then we have pyres patches, and we talked about pyres patches in our um, lymphatic lesson, but um, they are actually a collection of lymphatic tissue found in the submucosa, and it helps to increase the number um, toward the end of the small intestines. Next, of course, we're going to talk about the large intestines. So we went from the mouth to the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestines, and now we're at the large intestines. So the large intestines is a much is much larger in diameter than the small intestines, but it is actually shorter in length. 
it is only about five feet long as compared to the small intestine. So again, the large intestines is they're only bigger in diameter, not length. Um, and extends all the way from the ileocecal valve all the way to the anus. So the major function of the large intestine um, is to dry out um, indigestible food residue by absorbing water and to eliminate these residues from the body as feces. So it frames the small intestines on all three sides and has the following subdivisions, the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum, and the anal cavity. So you can see here in this diagram, this is the large intestines right here. And right in the middle, that's the small intestines. So the cecum is uh, a sac lake and it's the first part of the large intestines. And then you move on to the appendix, and the appendix um, hangs from the cecum and is um, kind of worm-like. And then we have the ascending colon. So the ascending colon travels up the right side of the abdominal cavity and makes a turn to travel across the abdominal cavity. The transverse colon is the ascending this is where the ascending colon makes the turn that I just described and continues to be the trans transverse as it moves across, transverse across um, the abdominal cavity. And then next, of course, we have the descending colon. So then this the large, intense, large intestines turns again at the colic or the splenic flexure and continues down the left side of the descending colon. Then we have the sigmoid colon. So the intestines then enters the pelvis where it becomes the S-shaped sigmoid colon. And then we have the anal canal um, and that ends at the anus, which opens to the exterior of the body, of course. And then we have the external anal sphincter. And this anal canal has an external voluntary sphincter. The external anal sphincter is composed of skeletal muscle. So moving on now to the accessory um, digestive organs or parts. Um, of course, remember in the beginning of this lesson, there are two main parts to the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so now we're moving on to the second part, the accessory organs or parts. So the role, the first one we're gonna talk about are the teeth. So the role the teeth play, the role the teeth play in processing um, food Obviously, you know, it doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. So we masticate or chew by opening and closing our jaws and from moving the food side to side while continuously using our tongue to move the food between our teeth. So next we have the salivary glands as part of the accessory digestive organs of the gastrointestinal system. So there are three pairs of salivary glands that empty their secretions into the mouth. We have the parotid glands, and these large parotid glands are anterior to the ears and empty their secretions into the mouth, as you can see right here. Then we have the submandibular and the sublingual glands, and these glands empty their secretions into the floor of the mouth through tiny ducts. Can think of these if you um, eat or if you eat something very sour, like a lemon, you can sometimes feel those sublingual glands just start to excrete their secretions. That's where they come from. So next we have saliva. So the product of the saliva glands is saliva, obviously, and it's a mixture of mucus and serous fluid. And then we have salivary amylase, and this is a clear serous portion that contains an enzyme, which is very important. It's um, in a bicarbonate rich juice that begins the process of starch digestion in the mouth. Moving on to the pancreas. So only the pancreas produces enzymes that break down all categories of digestible foods. 
So the pancreas is a gland that extends across the abdomen from the spleen to the duodenum, but most of the pancreas lies posteriorly um, to the parietal peritoneum. So pancreatic, pancreatic enzymes are secreted in the duodenum in an alkaline fluid that neutralizes the acidic chyme coming in from the stomach because uh, the stomach is very um, is known to be a very acidic a very acidic environment so now this is where all that acid is neutralized and then of course the endocrine function of the pancreas which we talked about in our endocrine lesson um, also obviously has endocrine functions. It produces hormones such as insulin and glucogen. Moving on to the liver. <clears throat> so the liver is the largest gland in the body. It's located under the diaphragm, more to the right side of the body. Uh, the liver has four lobes and it is suspended from the diaphragm and abdominal wall by delicate mesen by a delicate mesentery cord. Um, <clears throat> the liver's digestive function is to produce bile. So bile is a yellow to green watery solution containing bile salts, bile pigments, cholesterol, phospholipids, and a, vir and an, a variety of electrolytes. Bile salts um, <clears throat> do not contain enzymes, but um, it's bile salts emulsify fats by physically breaking down large fat globules into smaller ones. Um, and this helps to provide more surface area for the fat digesting enzymes to work on. Moving on to the gallbladder. So while in the gallbladder, bile is concentrated by the removal of water. The gallbladder is a small, thin, walled green sac that hides in a shallow groove in the inferior surface of the liver, as you can see right here in this diagram. And when food is not occurring, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when food digestive, digestion is not occurring, bile backs up the cystic duct and enters the gallbladder to be stored here. So let's break this all down, what we just talked about. So stages of digestion. Step one, of course, we're chewing, we're wetting the food with saliva in the mouth, we're swallowing the food, the saliva in the mouth starts to break down the carbohydrates. Next, we're swallowing. So after we swallow, food enters our esophagus, and this is where the peristaltic propul propulsion of food through the esophagus to the stomach. So the movement of food through the esophagus here to the stomach. Stage three is stomach digestion. And this is where proteins are digested by the way of gastric acid and other digestive juices. Moving along to the small intestine, and of course, the liver and the pancreas produce digestive juices and, and enzymes to digest food. Digestion of carbohydrates, fats, polypeptides, nucleic acids, <clears throat> all happen here. <laughs> then we move down to the large intestines is where absorption begins. And then to stage six or step six, waste elimination. So the physiology of digestion, so it's food ingestion and breakdown. So of course, we've talked about this in the beginning. Once food is placed in the mouth, both mechanical and chemical digestion begins. So of course, there's the physical breakdown. We're chewing the food. It's broken down into smaller particles. And then the chemical breakdown begins. And so um, when the food is mixed with saliva, that's where the saliva amylase begins the chemical digestion of starch. So remember that starch is begun to being broke down in the mouth. So stimulation of saliva. So when food enters the mouth, um, stimulation of saliva from the saliva 
salivary glands begins. And then the passageways, of course, the pharynx and the esophagus have no real digestive function. They just simply provide pass a passageway to carry food from the mouth to the next processing site, which is the stomach. So next, um, the next stage of the physiology of digestion is food propulsion, swallowing, and peristalsis. So deglutition or swallowing is a complex process that involves the coordinated activity of several structures, including the tongue, the soft palate, the pharynx, and the esophagus. We have the buccal phase of swallowing, and the first phase, the voluntary buccal phase, occurs in the mouth. Once the food has been chewed and while well mixed with saliva, the bolus is forced into the pharynx by the tongue. Then moving on to the pharyngeal esophageal phase, which is the second phase um, of the involuntary, and it's an involuntary phase. So this transports food through the pharynx and the esophagus. So the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system controls this phase and promotes the uh, mobility of the digestive organs from this point on. Food routes, so all routes that the food may take except the desired route, uh, distal into the digestive tract are blocked off. So the tongue blocks off the mouth, not allowing food to come back from the pharynx or the esophagus into the mouth. So the soft palate closes off the nasal passages. Their the larynx rises so that its opening is covered with the epiglottis. So that prevents, the epiglottis actually prevents food from going down into um, your lungs. And then it enters the stomach. And so once the food reaches um, the very end of the esophagus, it, it presses against the uh, cardioesophageal sphincter, causing it to open, and that's when the food then enters the stomach. Next, we're gonna talk about food breakdown during the physiology of digestion. So the sight, smell, and taste of food stimulate parasympathetic nervous system reflexes, which increase the secretion of gastric juice by the stomach gland. So, Gastric juice is just a, a secretion of um, gastric juices, and it's regulated by both the neural and humoral factors. Gastrin, so the hormone, ga the hormone gastrin stimulates the stomach glands to produce more pepsigen, mucus, and hydrochloric acid. Pepsigen, um, this, so the extremely acidic environment that hydrochloric acid provides is necessary because it activates this pep pepsigen to pepsin, the active protein digestive enzyme. Renin, so renin, um, the second protein digestive enzyme produced by the stomach works mostly on milk protein and converts it into a substance that it looks like sour milk. And then there's food entry. So as food enters and fills the stomach, the stomach walls begin to stretch at the same time as gastric juices are being secreted. And then the stomach um, wall activation. So muscles of the stomach walls um, become active. So they churn food, breaking it apart physically while simultaneously mixing the food with the gastric juices so that chyme is formed. Moving on to food propulsion. So peristalsis, as we talked about previously, is the movement of food towards the digestive tract. Peristalsis, so um, once food is mixed, that's when peristalsis begins in the upper half of the stomach and the contractions increase in the stomach in force as the food approaches the pyloric valve. Once it gets to, once the food or the contents get to the pyloric passage, of the stomach. Um, this is where the pylorus, so the pylorus of the stomach only holds about 30 mLs of chyme. So it allows only liquids and very small, small particles to pass through the pyloric sphincter with each contraction of the stomach muscle, sending around three mLs or less, or less of chyme into the small intestine. 
Next, we have the enterogastric reflex. So when the duodenum is filled with chyme, a nervous reflex, the ento enterogastric reflex occurs. So this reflex actually slows gastric activity and slows the emptying of the stomach by um, inhibiting the vagus nerves and tightening the pyloric sphincter to allow time for intestinal processing to catch up. Because you can't just empty all of the contents of the stomach into the small intestine all at one time. So that's what this reflex ha helps with. So moving on to absorption um, of the physiology of digestion. So food reaching the small intestine is only partially digested. Carbohydrates and protein digestion though has begun, um, but digestion of fats has not. We have brush border enzymes, and these are the microvilli, the small intestine um, cells that contain um, the brush border enzymes that break down double sugars into simple sugars and complete the protein digestion. And then foods entering the small intestine are saturated with enzyme rich pancreatic juices from the pancreas along with uh, brush border enzymes that complete the digestion of starches and are totally responsible for fat digestion and digestion of uh, nucle nucleic acids. So Next, when chyme enters the small intestine, it stimulates the mucosa cells to produce hormones called secretin, and this helps to release the pancreatic juices and bile. And then absorption of water of the end of products of digestion occurs in the small intestines. Most substances at this point are absorbed through the intestinal cell plasma membranes by the process of active transport. Then we have diffusion. So lipids or fats are absorbed passively by the process of diffusion. And then debris at the end of the ileum, which remains is some water, some indigestible food um, materials, large amounts of bacteria. Um, all of this remaining debris enters the large intestines through the ileocecal valve. We did talk about food propulsion, so peristalsis is the major major means of propelling food through the digestive tract. Um, the way that food is moved through the small intestines is like the way that toothpaste, if you can think of toothpaste being squeezed from the tube. And this is done with um, rhythmic contractions. So um, rhythmic contractions of the segmental movements produce con, um, constrictions of the intestines that mix and chime with the digestive juices and help to propel the food through the intestines. Moving on to food breakdown and absorption. So the contents that are now in the large intestines contain little nutrients and will will remain there for 12 to 24 hours. Um, the bacteria that live in its lumen of the large intestines metabolize some of the remaining nutrients, releasing gases that contribute to the odor of feces. And flatulence, flatulence or gas, about 50 ml of gas is produced by humans each day, much more when certain carbohydrate rich foods are consumed. Um, so the large intestines is limited to the absorption of vitamin K, some B vitamins, some ions, and most of the remaining water. And then feces, so this product is delivered to the rectum, contains the undigestible food residues, mucus, lots of bacteria, and just enough water to allow passage. So that was a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to know in the gastrointestinal system. Um, if you have questions about it, if you have concerns, if you need any clarification, you know that you can always email me or you can schedule office hours with me. Um, but I appreciate you all sticking with me through this. Um, we're almost done here. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.